All right, cool. So again, this is relational or not, choosing the best database for the task. Uh, very briefly, my name is Bob Pusateri. I've been a community member, DBA, software developer, a whole bunch of things. Probably the best thing on this slide is my contact information. So if you have any questions afterwards that we can't address, or if you're watching this video later and you want to contact me, feel free to reach out. You can email me, catch me on Twitter, any of the uh, methods we mentioned there. Uh, feedback, of course, is very important. It is how all us speakers uh, hone our craft and get better. So I would very much appreciate your feedback. I will have this link again at the end. Uh, and our agenda today, this is a short 20-minute session, so we're going to go through things fairly quickly. We don't have a whole ton on the agenda, but we're going to talk about relational databases, non-relational databases, and more or less the pros and cons of each, not necessarily in this order. Uh, and uh, hopefully we'll have some, uh, some interesting discussion here. So just to very briefly spell things apart, of course, relational versus non-relational databases. In a relational database, they're, of course, based on the relational model uh, originally proposed by E.F. Codd in a book he wrote in, I believe, 1970 or so. Um, data is stored in a structure called the table, of course, uh, and the database strictly enforces the schema and the constraints as you have defined them. Uh, relational databases tend to work best when the data is normalized uh, or made to, to fit well into a table or multi-table structure, and we'll talk about that a little more in the following slides. And when the data happens to violate those relational rules or what we call normal forms, bad things can happen, inefficiency, duplication of data. Uh, it's something we, we try to avoid to the most reasonable extent possible. Meanwhile, on the other side of the slide, the non-relational or the NoSQL side, and I'm going to use those terms interchangeably throughout this presentation, they're based on other models, so not the relational model, right? And there's, there's several different other models it could be. It could be a key value model, it could be a graph model, a document model, a columnar model. There's, there's different non-relational models you can use. Uh, and of course, the data then is stored not in a table structure. So if it was based on the document model, it would be in a document. If it was based in a graph, you'd have uh, nodes and edges, things like that. Um, in a non-relational database, the constraints are typically more enforced by the application than by the database itself. There can be some enforcement in the database, but usually you're doing it more in the application. And there also tends to not be a rigid schema present, which gives you more flexibility. Uh, you don't have to spell everything out ahead of time. Um, it allows you to, to manipulate that. And we'll see that in some of the uh, later slides as well. Uh, and typically, at least originally, NoSQL databases were, were really one of their shining factors was the fact that they were really easy to, easy to use with scale-out deployments. This is kind of based on the consistency model they use, right? You know, eventual consistency, uh, which, which used to be something that wasn't really taken seriously, and it's, it's really matured over the past years to the point where it can be a good thing, especially if it's something you need. So we'll talk about what that means as well. All right, so briefly, we're going to go to a computer science class here and just discuss some relational normal forms very quickly. Uh, the first normal form means each table cell contains a single value. So if I had a table with two columns like this, so I have an ID column and some names, and, and all three names are in one row, right? This, is, this violates the first normal form, and it would be really hard to select the row where the name was Kathy. You'd have to use some kind of text function, and then you'd still get this row with these other names as well, which maybe you didn't want. Of course, the solution to this is then to split it up into multiple rows and only have one value per cell, right? That's adjusting this to fit the first normal form. Now, the second normal form turns things up a little more and says that each non-key attribute needs to be dependent on the primary key. So let's say I have this table here with three columns. I got auto manufacturers, some, some vehicle models, and the country that they are headquartered in. Uh, this works kind of OK, except the country doesn't really depend on the model. It depends on the make. Right, so in this case, we would actually split this up into two tables. Uh, and this would allow us to adhere to the second normal form, whereas you know, the country is only dependent on the make, and then the model can also relate to the make, but separately, and you don't get duplication of data like we had previously. And then finally, the third one we'll look at in depth here is the third normal form. So each column is directly related to the primary key and not to any other column. And if anyone here is a, a Golden Age of Hollywood fan, we have some, some Academy Award winners over the years here from classic years. Uh, we have the award they won, the year they won it, the winner, and their birth date. And of course, the birth date of the winner is not really necessarily related to the award. It's related to the person. 
right? So Vivian Lee won Best Actress twice. She won in 1939 for Gone with the Wind and 1951, I think, for Streetcar Named Desire. Um, in this case, we could split that up and have, again, two different tables uh, and break that apart. So we have a birthday based on a winner, but then we have the winner based on the award and the year. So that is adhering now to the third normal form. All right, uh, there are other normal forms as well. There's voice cod normal form, fourth and fifth normal forms, but in, in usually in, in the working world, we don't deal with those. Maybe if you're an academic and you work with database, this is something you would do. But this, gets, this can get very, very, very normalized across lots of tables. You would have to do lots and lots of joins. I saw a system once where someone was storing IP addresses in the database, and for each octet of the IP address, they had a separate, separated out into different columns. Like, and now you're, you're rebuilding this data, and that takes more effort probably than it's worth. So with that in mind, how does NoSQL compare to all this? Of course, there's different models, as I mentioned. Uh, very briefly, I'm just going to pull up a, a sample of a document from a NoSQL document database, right? So this is, you know, a JSON document. And of course, we have some fields here. We have some system fields that I've crossed out because you don't need to see those values. Uh, but we're storing an ID, we're storing a URL, whether or not it's enabled. Uh, we have a use count counter and a last use counter. This is a system I have uh, for redirection, actually. So if you go to sqlbob.com slash zombocom, it will redirect you to zombo.com. And if you've never been to zombocom, check it out later. It's uh, quite the experience there. But this is a redirection system. This didn't really need to be in a relational database, so I didn't build it in one. I built it in Cosmos DB using the document model instead. Now, overall thoughts on non-relational databases. Some people say, and especially in years past, it used to be if, you know, it's no SQL, there's no schema, there's no design. Not true at all. There's actually a bunch of design that goes into it. It's just different types of designs in a lot of cases. Um, schemas in NoSQL generally do exist, and they're somewhat enforced by the database, not completely strictly, like I said, but they are strictly enforced by the application. And this can have some really nice advantages, especially when you're trying to deploy a change. Um, you don't have to worry as much about syncing, you know, deploying a relational database change and making sure that your application is ready for it or adding switches in your application to handle it, things like that. You can have the application change the database in uh, a document schema on a document by document basis, add properties on documents they need to be and not worry about it on ones they don't, right? So deployments can be easier in this case. Uh, but there are still some design decisions you really got to make early on, and if you're wrong, you'll probably pay for them later. Things like, what are my keys going to be, especially if you're dealing with, you know, a big scale-out system where partitioning really matters. Uh, and to talk about that, an example, I'm going to talk about Azure Cosmos DB, again, with the document model, just because it's nice and easy. Partitioning is a, a big deal here. If you make a poor partitioning choice now, you may have to rebuild your, your database or your collection later. Um, so in a container, which is a, a collection of documents in Cosmos DB, you have a partition key. In this case, I'm building a messaging system. I'm using a user ID as my partition key for this example. Um, the way Cosmos DB does this is it will hash the user ID to create you know, pseudo random distribution of them. So of course, you have lots of user IDs, you get lots of hashes, you get some nice random distributions of values. Now. As it gets split across partitions here, and let me show you what that means while I take a drink real quick. Sorry, you had to hear that. Um, we have physical partitions. So we have four physical partitions in this case, and then we have the logical partitions based on the username. So behind the scenes, Cosmos is doing this for you. Um, each physical partition in Cosmos DB is limited to 20 gigabytes. So it will handle this. Um, you can create one with either a single partition or multiple partitions, but it will manage all this for you. <clears throat> now, in this case, we have four partitions. It's going to do its best to distribute them, so roughly a quarter of each goes to one partition. Problem is, of course, and I apologize with the Paw Patrol names, but I felt it would work pretty well, um, there's not really an even distribution. Now, if anybody here watches Paw Patrol, first of all, I'm sorry. Um, but, you know, Chase, the police dog, was really popular. So Chase might have more data than the others. So maybe Chase needs his own partition, whereas, you know, Ryder and Marshall don't get quite as much attention. So they can share. And we have, you know, the lesser characters on the right. So this is all well and good. What happens if we need to grow? Well, this is another cool thing just about Cosmos DB is it can handle growing in the background automatically. <clears throat> so 
The partitions will be dynamically subdivided and they can grow the database without affecting availability behind the scenes. So if we need to split a partition, this just happens. Pretty cool. Now this, this course is all based on a good design decision at the beginning, choosing a good partition key. So got to think about your, your data, your request, your storage volume. Remember that 20 gigabyte limit I told you. <clears throat> um, sometimes adding dates to the partition will help with this. And for the best efficiency here, kind of like with partitioning in a relational database, you really want queries that can eliminate partitions. If you have a query and you don't specify your partition key, it will have to um, fan out and query all the partitions. <clears throat> uh, whereas if you can specify, it can eliminate them and save you traffic. Understand your workload, know what your most frequent and expensive queries are. This is not much different than, than good tuning in a relational database as well. Uh, but remember, in this case, partition keys are logical. More partition keys are usually better. <clears throat> so, going back to some of the theory here, of course, relational databases are ACID compliant, right? We have atomicity, consistency, isolation, durability. This is all great. What do we have on the, the NoSQL side? Well, they were pretty clever with this, and they came up with base. <coughs> Sorry. <clears throat> so, base is basically available, so we're going to try to ensure availability of the database with replication instead. Um, and again, we have soft states, so the database isn't enforcing as much consistency. Usually the developers of the application handle that part. And we have eventual consistency, right? Um, if the data, the most current copy of the data isn't available when it's queried, it might present you with an older version in the meantime. This is good in a lot of cases, depending on the application. Maybe if it's not. Um, so we have another rule of distributed databases. This is Brewer's CAP theorem. Um, CAP, consistency, availability, and partition tolerance. Pick two. All right, so you can choose to have each read is the most recent write and more available, but then you lose partition tolerance, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the idea here is this is a really good way to show trade-offs, especially when you're distributing a database such as a NoSQL database over lots of replicas. Uh, the problem with this is we're talking about all these consistency topics. There's not really a consistent definition of the word consistent in computer science, right? When we're talking about transactional databases, we're talking about, you know, database transactions moving from one valid state to another. That's consistency in ACID. Whereas in CAP, it's more about replication. It's getting a consistent view across replicated copies of data. And that doesn't even cover everything. So there's another example of when this matters, and that's the Pekelk theorem, right? So it's an extension of the CAP theorem, but we're saying basically if you have a big partition distributed system, you've got to choose between availability and consistency. And if you're not partitioning, you've got to choose between latency and consistency. All right, so to, to illustrate this very quickly, think about a situation where you have a reader and a writer, they're very far away in a big distributed database, uh, and a value gets updated. Should the reader that doesn't see that update yet, should it just show the old value because that's the latest one it has? Should it show the same result as the master? Or should it wait for the new value and make the people who are issuing queries wait as well? Uh, this would be prioritizing consistency at the expense of performance, of course. Cosmos DB, again, to talk about it very briefly, it has five different consistency models, so you can choose what you want. Um, you can have full-on eventual consistency where there are no rules. You can have strong consistency where it'll more or less behave like a transactional database. Uh, and there's some others in the middle that will give you some flexibility on that front as well. So all that talking about, probably the best way to sum this up, which database should you use when? Well, it depends, right? Um, let's talk about some bad ideas, right? A really bad idea in the relational database world is, is log storage, right? Anything that is like a log where it's mostly written and probably rarely read, right? How often do you read a log? Probably when you're trying to troubleshoot something that's gone wrong. Otherwise, you may not read it at all. Logs are usually tried to be written synchronously, um, and the reads are usually sequential and not random, right? If you're diagnosing something, you're probably reading through a log row by row. Uh, and then usually logs are kept for, you know, some period of time depending on the application and its importance, and then they're trashed. Um, logs aren't normalized. They're not even one first normal form compliant, right? There's all kinds of information in a log row, not really broken apart. It's just usually text, which is fine, but 
We only usually care about parts of the message. Uh, and if you're trying to search a log, you're probably doing a lot of, of wildcard searches, right? Um, they're also not transactional. And if the database fails and we're logging with the database, well, now we can't log anything, right? This is why even, even SQL Server doesn't use itself to write its logs, right? It just writes logs out to a text file instead. And finally, you know, does using a relational database make a logging better? No, I don't really think it adds anything to that. So I would not do that. Don't use the database when a perfectly good text file is a good idea instead. Next, images, right? Kind of the same idea, except we're talking now instead of text data, probably about binary data, right? Not a great idea for a relational database, especially. Uh, you're basically turning the database into a file system. Um, <coughs> apologies. <coughs> images are usually written, you know, or when they're read, they're read in their entirety, right? You can't read part of an image. Nothing will, good will come from that. It blows up the size of the database because it's usually larger data, doesn't usually compress well. Again, it's not transactional and there's no real value to storing it in a database. So use the file system, sorry. Um, what if you have lots and lots of text, right? I used to work in, in healthcare and we had all kinds of medical records and all the notes that were associated with that, tons and tons of text. Relational databases usually don't help large amounts of text either, right? You'd be doing lots of wildcard searches again. You'll probably be reading them in their entirety and not portions of them. It's, it's really a, a bad situation if you're trying to put large text documents in a relational database. This is where a document database may be a better fit. Question? Am I, do, do I need to be louder? Is that what you're saying? If, 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 they could, if they can crank my volume up a little more, please, maybe that would help. Thank you, thank you. I'll talk a little more. I'm sorry if it's not. I, I can speak louder too, but hopefully they can amplify me a bit more in the final few minutes here. Um, all right, no SQL bad ideas, right? Anything where strict ACID is required, right? If you're really requiring strict transactional uh, app in your application, stick with a relational database system, right? If you're doing financial information, if you really need to use transactions to ensure consistency, I would probably not use a, a no SQL database for that at that point. Um, another NoSQL bad idea is database, or data that's already relational, right? Why, why are we reinventing the wheel and trying to, to take data and convert it from one form to another? Does that really give us anything? Maybe it does, but I used to work at a place where we spent lots and lots of time taking non-relational data and making it relational for no good reason at all. And when we finally stopped doing that, uh, a whole lot of goodness came out of that, right? So if your data can easily be arranged into relational entities, well, then I'd probably store it in a relational database instead. There's no need to create more work than we need to. Two minutes left and I got one slide left. This worked pretty well. So great ideas for NoSQL, right? If you have schema lists, if you have unstructured data, if you have data that fits really well into a non-relational model, well, I'd use that then, right? If you have really big massive scale out requirements, uh, this is where a lot of non-relational databases can really, really shine. Uh, and if you have data that would, you know, model itself and end up being in a single table in a relational database by itself, well, then I'd probably consider non-relational for that, too. All right. We are at the last slide with two minutes to go. Um, again, if you'd like to uh, submit an evaluation, there's the link. If you want to contact me, I have my info right here. And if there's any questions, we can take them right now. Otherwise, I'll give you two minutes back. Thank you very much. Questions? No. Thanks.